Hello and welcome to Scott Rock, where your hosts from Climb Scotland, Robert McKenzie, and me, Cal McBain, catch up with climbers every two weeks who have different epic tales to tell us. We hope you enjoy the show. And remember, when you're out climbing, be safe and do your buddy checks. Ready? No. <laughs> <laughs> right, welcome back to Scott Rock. We are back again for episode... What was it? What did I say this was? 32.5? 33.5. 33.5. Yes, we are uh, back with Lana Dunsmuir uh, for... Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, for part two of my therapy session. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we are back with the mental health professional that is Lana Dunsmuir. Um, following on from her previous episode where she got to tell her story, this is uh, her giving a bit of uh, a public service announcement, if you will. <laughs> you put it like that. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of advice, uh, just kind of general stuff that might help anybody that's dealing with any kind of fears or anxiety or whatever when we are going at the crag, at the crag, on the route, whatever it may be. Um, you know, things that we have, things that we all experience at some point or another. Um, so yeah, we're just going to take this as a as a bit of a conversation. We're going to run through things. We've got kind of three topics that we want to talk about, the kind of feelings that we get before we get to the crag and whether we should push through them or not and what to do um, and things to do when we get that anxiety or that fear when we're actually on the climb. Um, so we're just going to kick this off with uh, before you get to the crag or before you get on your climb while you're where you arrive at the crag, you're sitting at the base or you're sitting in the climbing wall, um, and you're feeling that anxiety, you're feeling that fear, that nervousness before you, you get on your, your project or whatever it may be. Um those feelings are completely okay. Yeah, of course. Like like they're there for a reason. Yeah. Like they're there because you're either worried about the route, like it's a really hard route potentially, you've maybe been working it for a while and you're just getting more and more frustrated if you haven't ticked it yet, or there could be a number of reasons for that, but yeah, you're a human being, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're allowed to feel anxious, you're allowed to feel afraid, you're allowed to feel joy, you're allowed to feel frustrated about the the particular route or activity whatever it is yeah yeah those yeah. feelings are all perfectly valid and you're not feeling that way for no reason and i think like we've, we've definitely well i definitely have felt that i know mm. you have felt that i know many yeah. many many other people have felt yeah. that you know and it, it for some people it might just be a little bit of nervousness thinking today's the day i'm gonna go on my project you know <laughs> or it sometimes for some people it's totally crippling anxiety yeah. you know it can come in come in many forms but those feelings are completely okay um, and the first thing that we're kind of going to touch on is that, well, bailing is always an option. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the first things I learned <laughs> <laughs> when I started climbing, that, that bailing is always an option. And you're not a failure because you've decided that today's not the day. Actually, you're making a judgment call based on how you're feeling, maybe in terms of your mental well-being, how you're feeling in your in terms of your physical well-being. Like maybe you've you've overtrained a little bit so you're actually not feeling as strong because you've not given your body the the physical rest that it needs as well as the, the kind of mental rest that yeah, it requires yeah. as well um so yeah there you're not compelled to climb the route just because you've turned up yeah like yeah, you exactly. can decide that you don't have to do it and and more importantly i don't think any climber would deliberately and maliciously chastise you for it no, either. Absolutely not. Like, yes, I know we all take the piss out of each other and we <laughs> all try and, you know, wind each other up. But I don't think anyone would would be malicious with it because every single one of us have had that feeling at some point or another. Yeah. Some people have it maybe more regularly than other people, but it's it, it's almost just part of that climbing experience. And I think there is an element of just needing to normalise that and you're hearing more you know, big name climbers like I mentioned mentioned um Hazel Finlay the last time. You know, she's so open about the difficulties she's had and the processes that she's had to go through to the point where she is doing, you know, some education around her her own psychology and 
psychology in general to be able to kind of understand what's happening with her with her brain and her mind during those times so yeah. um i think it's something you know we shouldn't be afraid of those feelings but we should get to know them and maybe even get a little bit comfortable with them as well yeah um so that we don't feel as afraid because we're not repressing them we're not pushing them to the side yeah. we're actually perhaps trying to relate to them a little bit so let me ask then in the interest of you know being more comfortable with something comes from knowledge about it like you said hazel's mm -hmm. gone through lots of learning to kind of upskill herself in this and maybe get a bit of training on it um so it, it might help everybody to maybe understand what anxiety actually is like yeah. what what that is where it may came, come from what are the what are the reasons in climbing specifically that people might have for feeling that anxiety yeah um yeah. so and i suppose where it comes from and and the, the huge general sense we don't really have a full understanding but what we do know is that it's something that is triggered within us when we are subjected to worry fear or a general unease um, you know, I suppose it can be triggered by a lot of factors. You know, for some people, there could be a genetic predisposition to to suffering from a severe um, case of anxiety. So perhaps maybe to the level of a diagnosis. Um, it can be embedded in trauma, stress, drugs and alcohol, chronic pain. There can be triggers for anxiety that come up and, and that anxiety can be appropriate but where it can start to affect our daily functioning is perhaps where we're maybe not managing it in the best that we can be. Um, and I suppose for the purpose of this conversation, when we're talking about anxiety, we're not really talking about maybe the, the, the severe end of the spectrum where where you're perhaps needing some some counselling or some more extensive intervention. Mm. We're kind of we're talking about that day to day anxiety and how we best manage that so that it's not interfering with the things that we love as much. Um, so I suppose we're going to talk about it in the context of, of just climbing. Mm -hmm. So anxiety is not this huge convoluted thing that we need to understand. We don't have to have multiple different principles that underpin it in our mind. We just need to understand that it is part of a response. Um, one of the things people most commonly associate with anxiety is we, we instantly think of the fight or flight and freeze response um and that is a part of anxiety you know it's it's like that that age-old example if you're faced with a lie and you're gonna either run from it you're gonna fight it or you might freeze from it altogether um yeah most of us i think would run <laughs> we're not gonna get far <laughs> but but we'll probably run <laughs> um but yeah so essentially it's just looking at how how we best manage it and what that anxiety looks like for us. Because I guess to each individual, anxiety has its own, it's your own subjective experience. Like how anxiety might man manifest in me it might not be exactly how it manifests in you. Um, some people can have a lot of physiological symptoms, so they might sweat profusely. They might have really bad tremors. Um, they might They might struggle to breathe and things like that. Um, obviously, in, in some cases, people can experience panic attacks as a result of the, the level of anxiety they're experiencing. Um, so, yeah, it's not something that I don't think it's difficult for people to, to understand. I think I think most of us have a basic understanding of what anxiety is. I think what we struggle to understand is what anxiety means to us as individuals and, and how we experience yeah. anxiety. Um, as individuals and I suppose when we try and talk about an individual experience generally it's very hard it's to really, do so really, especially hard to do so on a podcast with yeah, many people listening exactly well it's a few like if I just say well this is what anxiety looks like some people could be listening going well I think I've experienced anxiety but it doesn't look like that in me yeah so I think like you said I think most people have got at least a basic understanding of mm -hmm. what anxiety is mm -hmm. um I think there's still Correct me if I'm wrong here, but there, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of people who have definitely felt it, but yeah. deny that it's as bad as anxiety. It's just mm -hmm. a, a bit of fear or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we've all felt at least a degree of it in yeah. in, in some way or form. Yeah. So where where can that anxiety come from? Like, what are the triggers from climbing that generally cause or can cause that anxiety? 
because I think, like you said, it's 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 improving our own knowledge of it, and mm-hmm. part of it is understanding what anxiety is, but part of it is, is understanding and where it comes from, what yeah. the trigger is. Yeah, and I guess when it comes to the trigger, I mean, the trigger might have nothing to do with climbing in itself. Like, if you've got a really stressful life outside climbing, and I know we touched on this in, on the last podcast, but um, if you've got a lot going on in your life, you know, and then you go climbing, if you're turning up to the crag already feeling stressed out your box, not feeling that you're at your your kind of strongest in terms of your, your mental well-being, then, I mean, it stands to reason you're, you're probably not going to be performing at your best. Similarly, if you were feeling kind of physically unwell, like even if you were a bit run down and you decided to go climbing, you wouldn't hold that same expectation that you would climb really well, but we seem to disregard um, our mental well-being in that situation and just think, well, it's stress, climbing helps me with stress, so, you know, it shouldn't affect my performance. But actually, it really can affect your performance because if your mind is preoccupied with lots of different thoughts that are coming in and out of your head, you're not really really present in that moment because... There's so much else going on. So part of that, part of that can be what's going on in your life externally. Um, or if we're just looking at climbing specifically, you know, one of the or, or two of the the biggest things that we hear people talking about is the fear of failing, fear of falling. Yeah. So a lot of people's anxiety when it comes specifically to climbing is rooted in those two um elements. Yeah. So <clears throat> and with that, I mean we I kind of mentioned as well previously when it comes to particularly the fear of falling. Yeah, you've kind of been designed to understand that falling will lead to injury and that's not good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's it's perfectly normal to have a fear of falling. It's yeah, there, there's nothing irregular about that. There's nothing that should make you feel you know, inadequate because you're afraid of, of falling off a wall. If if we were talking about anything else here, or if we had people in the room that weren't climbers, they would be sitting going, what are you talking about? You've got fear of, of course you've of got, course fear, you got of fall- fear of falling off. Of course you've yeah. got, like, we've all got fear of falling. Like, come on. <laughs> but as climbers, we find that really debilitating because it prevents us from being able to, to climb the route we want to climb. Yeah, I suppose there are things that you can look at generally that may help with these elements. Yeah. But fear of failing has the same, you know, we we don't want to fail you know we've been it's been the the social norm that we succeed and Mm. we do well in life we get you know good grades to get us a good job we get a good job we get a good spouse we try and raise our kids so that they're they grow up to have good lives and you know we we end up trying to accumulate all this this wealth of success that we have completely ignored the fact that there is a benefit in failing there are, there are a lot of positives that come from failing in situations at life. And actually, I think it's it's almost important to make sure you are failing. Very at important times. to fail. Um, because, well, one, it helps you learn to cope, to be able to deal with those negative feelings. Because if you are constantly in a state of trying to avoid any kind of negative experience or any kind of negative emotion, you will never build up any effective coping mechanisms. And one day you will crack. Hmm. something will happen and you will crack so having this kind of collection of of failures in different areas in your life you know we need to change how we look at that it, we don't have to look at it in a very you know melancholic way that that just makes us sad and feel low and um, we can actually look at it in a way that helps us to do better to hmm. to push harder in life to to make sure that we're not making the same mistakes over and over and over again. So I think that there's a real art to failing, but we, ironically, we fail to miss that. <laughs> like, 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 it's it's a really good. good thing. That's good. It's a really good thing. But yeah, so I think part of, I mean, part of when I talk to, to patients, maybe in the context of their work, because not all my patients are climbers <laughs> it's not necessarily people don't end up on my doorstep because of, of, of stress at climbing it's, it's lots of other issues um but failure is a common thing that that people suffer from you know really tormented mental health issues as a result of just failure alone um so a lot of time is spent trying to reshape and reframe people's yeah. perception of failure um which can be done and you can practice it 
Um, and some of what we will talk about may help with some of those things. But I suppose one thing I would say is that there's so many things to, to cover and to talk about when it comes to strategies or therapeutic approaches that we can't cover everything. No, so, I'm not even going <laughs> to try. Gonna be, I'm not going to be covering everything. But I'm always open if people have questions, they can ah. ask me anytime. So, like you said, there's... These are all triggers for the anxiety. These, you know, the fear of failing, the fear of falling, that's not the anxiety itself. It's the trigger that causes the anxiety. And like we said, that, that anxiety is totally cool. These are all totally normal triggers that, that everybody goes through at some point in their climbing career, potentially still goes through and will always go through. Um, so it's totally okay to have those feelings and, and to have that anxiety, to have those as triggers. Um, and... It's definitely okay to say, well, maybe today's just not the day. Yeah. Like, it's absolutely. totally okay to, to feel those feelings and go, today isn't the day I'm going to try and fight through mm -hmm. these or try and work through these. Like, it, it's a bit too much today. I'm not going to do yeah. the project or, or whatever the, the, the thing is that's making you feel anxious. Um, so rather than forcing yourself into an uncomfortable situation that you're going to be more anxious in, yeah. what what things could we do maybe when we arrive to the crag, arrive at the crag or before we get to the crag that, or before we get to the route that, mm -hmm. uh, what could we do? Yeah, so there's lots of things you can do. And actually, generally speaking, I think a lot of people will be doing a lot of, I suppose I'm going to refer to them as strategies because they are strategies for coping with anxiety. Um, People will probably do a lot of these things already, but they're perhaps not recognising that they're doing it as a way of, of coping. So that might be, okay, if you're able to identify exactly what's triggering the feeling, fantastic. But don't stress about it if you can't identify why the anxiety is there. Regardless, you're feeling it, so you have to deal with it. Um, so that might be, you know, letting your, if you're with another climber, let the other climber go, let them climb a route. Let, you know, you can be lay. Get, let them have a shot, top rope, second. If you feel that you just can't be anywhere near that rock, then it might be about taking yourself away for a moment, going for a walk, trying to relieve some of that that anxiety. Um, there's a lot of evidence come out regarding just the benefits of being outside in nature to manage low mood and anxiety. Um, and in fact, NHS Highland, now I can't remember what area in NHS Highland I want to say, was it Strath's Bay area, something like that? Um, they were piloting, you know, GPs doing prescriptions for outdoor exercise for people who were struggling with, with very mild symptoms of anxiety or low moods. Um, and effectively what the, what the evidence is saying is that just being in nature can reduce stress, it can be relaxing, it reduces our cortisol levels, it can reduce our muscle tension, um, and overall, it can help our physical well-being, of course, as well. So it can reduce our risk of cardiovascular um, illnesses too. It reduces our risk of things like depression or symptoms of depression as well. Um, and can actually help our ability to, to recover more quickly from psychological stress or distress. Um, and with that, I suppose we have that that connection to community as well when we're out and about. You know, how many times if you go out for a walk whether you're out on your own or you're you're out with a dog and you always bypass someone and you always say oh hi there yeah lovely day isn't it or nice weather or it's, it's Scotland so pish weather isn't it <laughs> and you have a bit of that contact and it's it's you know you might not be standing with someone for 10-15 minutes but it's still a little yeah. bit of sharing that sense of community well, there's probably going to be um, well there's mostly most of the time there's other people absolutely. at the climbing wall that you're at or at the crag that you're at Absolutely. Yeah. So just being present, being there can be enough to help alleviate some of that anxiety and distress. And actually, and I am going to anecdotally mention, although this is not <laughs> solely related to climbing, but it's a really interesting piece of information. Um, just uh, there was a study that was done and, and research is showing that actually schools, so kind of urbanised schools, so you're primary, secondary schools that are in cities like Glasgow, for example, if they are near what we refer to as green spaces, there's actually been some evidence to say that it promotes cognitive development in kids. So just having that space to be out in nature is so helpful for our own development, even from such a young age. And like, there's, 
you know, these are things that you can do when you're when you're at the crag. You, you know, you don't or at the climbing wall, at the crag. I keep saying at the crag. It's, yeah, it could be. Uh, it could be the, a climbing wall. Yeah, all it the could listeners be, aren't just yeah. outdoor climbers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, these are things that you can do instead of mm. getting on the route or the project yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, you, like Lana said, you could you know just spend some time outdoors you could have the social side of it you could climb something else you could yeah. i mean um, you could even second the, to climb your route on a top rope or whatever but yeah. there's also the option of well today's definitely not the day i'm just gonna go home yeah absolutely you can bail and i think and i i have briefly mentioned this before but i think one of the biggest things that we need to do when we are struggling with these these overwhelming feelings is recognize that we're not feeling great it's perfectly all right as we've established but we also need to bring those expectations that we have of ourselves to meet where we are at at that present moment because if at that present moment we are not at our optimal performance level whether it's because of our physical well-being or our mental well-being or a combination of both you know we can't belittle ourselves all the time and try and set impossible expectations when you're feeling well you might be able to do many different things you know you might be able to you know climb an e5 no bother you know generally on a day where you're performing at your best that might be no problem you might be on a sport route and you could send seven a with your eyes closed but if you're not feeling great for whatever reason you're not going to be able to do that so having that same expectation is going to be really detrimental to you so it's about forgiving yourself for that and realizing I recognize I'm not myself today I recognize that I'm not able to perform at the level I know I can but that's okay because I can take some time to just rest to to be outside to be with people to still be part of my climbing community because I don't want to isolate from that but I don't have to have the expectation that I need to be excelling today yeah. And just having the honest conversation with yourself. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we've just touched on that bailing is always an option. Yes. But when the the anxiety that you're feeling is is not quite enough to make you want to leave it alone, um, yeah. and you would rather take it on, work through it, and be able to get on your climb or on the project, whatever. Um, it's therefore, like we said at the start, uh, important to identify or try and at least identify why you're feeling anxious mm -hmm. because that's that can help you try and work through it. There's loads of, sort of climbing coachy things that we could do mm -hmm. to try and work through that. There's also some psychological yeah. things that we could do to try and work through that. Mm -hmm. um, and this will give you the kind of the best chance of doing something that helps reduce that anxiety. Um so what are some of the ways that we could try and manage that anxiety if we do think, no, I'm going to try and work on this so that I can get on the project? Yeah. I mean, some people, and, and you'll have seen it quite a lot, and actually you do this, Robert. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like you just, or, or, or what it looks like externally, um, is that it's just a, whew, right, shake it off, I'm going for it. And it's just, it just takes, sometimes it just takes that moment of just complete gumption and confidence to go, screw it, I'm doing it, great, I'm going to go on it, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm committing, that's it. Um, and that's fantastic. Hey, if you get that, go for it, let it, let it go. You can change your mind um, when you're climbing. It's just, you know, harder to <laughs> <laughs> when you start climbing. Um, so yeah, there, there can just be that initial way of, oh, I'm not dealing with it. I'm just going for it. And it can be a really positive thing because it gives you that confidence that you need. Even if it's short-lived, it gives you the confidence that you need to just get on and try it. Yeah. Um, so it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It, it's good if you can if you can have that. It, it, sometimes people will get, you know, they, they have this moment of gumption. It's just, I'm just going to go on and I'm just going to do it. And I'm just going to fight through it. And that's how it's going to be. That's fine. That's fine. I, I wouldn't always recommend that strategy for life in general, but it can be really good to get you to just take that step yeah. out of the comfort zone. It can be a really positive way. Um, another way to manage it that can be really helpful is just practicing some deep relaxation breathing techniques. So that is, you know, deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth, slow and controlled. 
Um, try not to do too many. People can feel a bit dizzy. Um, you know, you're taking in a bit more oxygen in any more any one time than you're used to. Um, so I would generally, you know, if I'm practicing that on my own, I generally don't tend to do any more than five. That's about enough for me. Um, it, because if you're doing, if you're breathing properly, so slowly in through the nose, out through the mouth, it is similar to to what you would use a, a beta blocker for. So a beta blocker is, is a medication that helps slow your heart rate. Um, deep relaxation breathing techniques have that same experience they mm. slow your heart rate down and that's what causes those symptoms of anxiety you might be feeling to relax because you're mimicking that same um kind of method yes there oh, you go cool. you, you learn something new every day mm. um of course we'd mentioned just taking yourself off for a short walk just to deal with whatever's going on in your mind at that time um that can also be helpful it might just be about taking a seat and having something to eat you know, one of the things that can cause a lot of, not just, it doesn't just exacerbate anxiety that we may already have, but it can mimic the symptoms of anxiety. So just having a drop in our blood sugar or a spike in our blood sugars as well. So just being able to to keep an eye on the foods that we're eating, particularly, you know, if you are looking to, if, if what climbing is for you is partly, you know, related to being able to perform well in the sport, looking at your diet out with climbing just for health and well-being in general really to be honest with you um but making sure that your diet's rich in in proteins and complex carbohydrates things that sustain you that prevent these kind of fluctuations in your blood sugar that can mimic the symptoms of anxiety so i would suggest if you're feeling a bit anxious just take a seat have a breath and have something to eat like making sure that thing is is not just necessarily sugar yes you know when we're out in the hills are and you we're... saying a handful of haribo isn't the best thing for you <laughs> i'm saying that can be good that can be good if you're mountaineering <laughs> and you need quick bursts of energy you don't you know before you go out into the hills you know have that really healthy whole yeah. grain sustained complex carb um rich breakfast but when you're out on the hill, it's different. You know, you're needing immediate energy. So yes, sugary stuff's great for that. Um, not so much when we're trying to manage symptoms of anxiety. And high sugar diets obviously cause the blood sugars to spike and give us the symptoms of it or mimic the symptoms of anxiety, which if you're already feeling anxious is going to probably worsen those symptoms a lot more. So a sugar high is not the solution sugar high is definitely not the solution <laughs> definitely not the solution um and would not recommend it at all um so yeah definitely that's one of the things so i'm going to summarize some of that because again i go off into tangents so you know taking maybe five deep relaxation breaths in through the nose out through the mouth before you go to step on the wall um taking yourself off for a walk for a breather if you have any strategies that you use that you've practiced before that help you, utilize them, recognize them as strategies um, and taking some time just to have something to eat. So, yeah, I am. Um, and another one that can be really helpful to try and minimize some of that, that pre-climb anxiety <laughs> um, is just taking a moment to read your route. You know, if it's a... If it's what do you mean by read your route? Oh God! Here we go. Here, the root setter <laughs> asks asks the mental health practitioner by reading your root. He's making me say this because I am very bad at root reading. <laughs> but root reading is just the the whole the whole principle behind that is just about taking the time before you step on the wall to have a look at where the holds are, where does the route want you to go, what's the best holds for you, um, if it's trad, looking at where the gear might be or where your best gear might be, um, you know, what position are you going to be, best be in to place that gear, things like that. Um, so yeah, just taking a moment to actually identify where the route wants you to go <laughs> and yeah. where you want yeah. to go as well um, to make sure you don't end up off route, which I've done many a time. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's Root reading can help minimise some of that anxiety because it is just about being as prepared as possible. You know, it is just about taking those steps that help you feel a bit more reassured about your movements, that help you feel a bit less anxious or a bit less stressed about the situation. If you are feeling quite overwhelmed by 
the route that you're going to climb or just climbing in general. So just taking that moment. Um, and if you're still just struggling to, to get to terms with that and to get on that particular route, try another route, you know, try something yeah. that's a bit more within your grade, that's yeah, a bit cool. easier, just to get a little bit of that confidence to recognise, well, I do know how to route read and I do know how to climb. So there's no reason I can't climb this route. I just need to give myself a moment to go over this mental block. Um, so I think one of the biggest things, and one of the things that's helped me personally, is just having those honest conversations with myself. Um, and yes, it's easy. I suppose in a sense, it could be easier when you know what questions to ask yourself. Um, but equally, you don't have to go into like a hour long debate. You know, you just have to think, well, what is it I want to get out of this? Yeah. And yeah. what steps do I need to take to be able to get me to my, my goal? Yeah. Um, so those are, you know, th that's a really good list of options for dealing with that anxiety or working through that anxiety or just bailing from it altogether and, and doing something else those are really good options for what to do before you get on the climb but i think a lot of us have at least experienced at least once feeling totally okay getting on the climb and then it hits you having that anxiety having that fear when we're on the route um and it either totally stopping us being able to do the thing, causing us to fall off, causing us to totally freak out, mm -hmm. or just like you said, freezing from it all together and sitting there for 45 minutes on a ledge weeping. Yes. <laughs> we've all been I'm sure there. we've all been there, <laughs> we've right? All we've all been there. there. We've all been um, there. <laughs> so yeah, um, sometimes like, yeah, the, the anxiety just kicks in halfway through, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. again, it's totally 100% natural to yeah. feel like this. I think we've all been there. We'll all have moments where something happens or we're, we come across something we're not expecting or it just all builds and finally hits you um and yeah it, we get it, it yeah. it's totally okay yeah. um and it's okay to, again back off bailing is always an option mm -hmm. you can you can always lower down you can always come down um as long as your gear is good enough to lower off if you're trying climbing yeah. um no, you just but you don't down. have you don't <laughs> have to force yourself through it yeah uh, bailing is always an option and again you can go through all the things that we spoke about earlier um but if you do if you do want to manage that anxiety, get your head back in the game and try and do the route. What can you do or because what can you do to help yourself manage that? Again, in your earlier podcast, you talked about grounding. Yeah. Um so do you want to talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So I, I for people who haven't ever heard of grounding before and and I suppose the reason why this is a good one to talk about it because I did I, I did kind of briefly mention it in the the last podcast and I suppose if you don't know what it is you'd just be left going what the hell and it essentially I suppose we've all heard of grounding you know you have that that expression that's you know you've got to keep your feet on the ground or alternatively you've got to keep your mind on the ground is the way some people express it um, Nobody expresses it like that. Uh, well, it, they, they do in my community, <laughs> my community of mental health practitioners, therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't. That stinks. <laughs> That's a toxic fart. Brilliant. Tolly, our dog just farted oh, and it's stinking. Amazing. <laughs> But usually I refer to that kind of saying of keeping your feet on the ground. So we've all heard it, we've all used it, and we kind of know what that means. Effectively, grounding is a, a self-soothing, self-regulating skill to manage negative emotions or feelings that we might be experiencing in that particular moment. It, it's a strategy that's designed to connect you to the here and now. So it, it's essentially a means of pulling you away from whatever negative thoughts are going through your mind so whether it's I can't do this I'm not good enough I'm not strong enough it's too far away I'm too short I'm too tall whatever these these ruminations might be um it's designed to kind of pull you from that and uses the the five senses to be able to do that um for that particular moment what I might do is when I'm needing to visualize part of it to keep me in the moment I'll look at what my holds are like that I'm holding on to I'll be like do they feel stable do they feel okay are they good am I comfortable am I uncomfortable and try and work out how I'm feeling at that present moment and then look to see what the next hold is you know am I going to a jug am I going to an even worse hold what does that look like 
So that is part of it. So being able to see, being able to touch it um, and being able to, when we talk about the, the sense of smell, we're not necessarily, you know, talking about sniffing cracks in the rock or anything like that. You know, it might be about closing your eyes, taking a breath if you're comfortable enough and paying attention to the smells of nature around you, like the smell of the birch trees, if there's birch trees around you or whatever might be in your environment. You know, listening to the sounds of the birds going past, people conversation, having conversations um, on the ground, your ear you chatting away, talking to you or talking to someone else. Not that you should be talking to someone else, but you know. <laughs> um, but paying attention to some of those sounds that are happening around you. And, and it can sound a wee bit, you know, airy-fairy when we talk about it in that sense. But what it's trying to get your mind to do is to be present not to be distracted with thoughts that are unhelpful, but to keep you in that moment, grounded to that moment and connecting only with what's happening around you physically in that moment. Um, there is, of course, one of the senses is taste. Don't go licking roots. <laughs> don't Please don't go licking rocks. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't do that. That's probably one of the ones that I don't use because... <laughs> You know, I wouldn't recommend you go up chewing a sweet either, because if you do fall, hmm. you don't want to be at risk of choking. So I would just rule out the whole taste one altogether, unless yeah. anyone can think of a way to incorporate that <laughs> uh, while you're on a route. If you can, let me know, because I'd love to try it. So, yeah, um, like, so, you know, you feel this anxiety when you're on the route. It's your mind might be going a million times a minute with mm -hmm. lots of thoughts about, you know, the uh, am I going to fall off? Mm -hmm. Is the next hold good? Where's my last bit of gear? Where's my next bit of gear? Mm -hmm. Where's that bolt? Is, is the bolt miles below me? If I fall off, what's going to happen? What are the consequences? Mm -hmm. How far is it to the nearest hole? Mm -hmm. A million thoughts going through your head. They're all unhelpful. And they're all really all unhelpful. All really unhelpful. And from, from that, like, grounding is taking a moment to quiet in all those voices mm -hmm. and focus on like you said just the present yes. so what those, you that see, hold... what you can what you can see what you can touch what you can hear yeah. it, it's it's about keeping yourself exclusively to to that moment yeah. and dedicate yourself wholly and i i find it easier to do when i when i do some controlled breathing throughout it because it helps me keep myself relaxed because if i just suddenly feel stressed and try and go all right, I'm going to feel this hold and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do that. I'm just, like, I'm rushing myself through it and I'm just adding to the anxiety yeah. that I'm already yeah. feeling. So it's about trying to slow the process down. And yeah, that it, how you implement that can be can be difficult depending on what you're climbing because see if you're on, like, a, you know, if you're a Robbie Phillips, you know, that kind of level and you're climbing E10, you are never going to be in a comfortable position. <laughs> Regardless of how strong you are, you're never going to be in a comfortable position to be able to necessarily practice that. Um, but what you might be able to do is when you're projecting a route like that is practice some of those skills yeah, and techniques yeah. so that you're developing a more positive association with those hard moves or those crux moves because you know that when you've been on it before and you've been relaxed you can do it really well so it stands to reason if you do everything you can to make your feel, yourself feel a bit more relaxed and if you've trained yourself to feel more relaxed on that particular route you're probably less likely to to suffer it yeah so I suppose it you know it does not matter what route you're on you know even elite climbers will still have these same difficulties and would still have to go through similar processes I'm not saying everybody has to do grounding um but it is a really good it is a good skill it has an evidence base and it can actually help if you are struggling with feeling overwhelmed on a route and you're feeling anxious and you need to try something immediately that helps reduce some of that stress or some of that anxiety that you're yeah. feeling um and and as an evidence based practitioner I want to make sure that if people are going to be advised, it's with information that actually has some good research around it. Um, so, yeah. And if you if you practice grounding and stuff like that before, you're probably already doing it um, as part of your climbing. But if you're not, I would challenge you to give it a go, because the worst thing that can happen is that you don't get benefit from it, in which case that's fine. You can explore other strategies. Um, but one thing I would say is that it does take a little while, although it can work immediately, in order to get the most benefit out of something like grounding, you do need to practice it and you do need to give in to it. Yeah. You know, you need to get rid of that, that 
schema in your mind that says, well, that's a very, you know, yogi type <laughs> practice. <laughs> you know, it's people who sit around a fire saying kumbaya. And yeah, it's yeah. not at all. It's something that lots of us practice. And actually, the reason why we advocate it as clinicians yeah. is because it has evidence to say this does help people. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, before I met you, mm -hmm. I was doing this kind of stuff like I, I was at times dissociating from feelings at times I, I was using grounding you know and it's only since having conversations with you that I've kind of identified oh that's that is what I've been doing you yeah. know it's a kind of yeah. it, we it's something that we might all be doing yeah. already yeah you know it's just coping me mechanisms yeah. and we might have figured it out yeah, um, and it's like I said earlier, a lot of things that we're discussing here, a lot of people probably already do, but yeah. it's just recognising that these are actually strategies. Yeah. These are evidence-based, you know, it, it, whatever you need to do. Because one of the things that, that I suggest as well is, you know, if you have been struggling with anxiety and climbing, it's making sure that there is some kind of reward, you know, for you even going and trying. So, like, just going to the crag, whether you climb or not, you know, whether you get out the car or not, you know, for some people, it can be so bad that just getting into the car just to go to the crag is such a big hill yeah. to, to climb over for, for a lot of people. And, and I was <laughs> in that over, boat, pun climb intended. over, pun intended, nice. <laughs> um, but it can be. And, and I was in that boat not long ago with my climbing and I always would make myself feel bad for it. I would I would berate myself and make myself feel worse and then expect myself to feel better mm. the next time I go climbing despite the fact I've spent every other day making myself feel bad for it um, when actually if you're kind to yourself and you're compassionate and you give yourself rewards well that instills a bit more of a, a positive association yeah. with just trying yeah. you know one of my rewards if I went climbing and even if I was only second in is that I would get like a really nice bubble bath when I got home <laughs> Because, and believe it or not, there's evidence yeah. to say that a bubble bath, well, maybe not so much the bubbles, but a bath that can actually reduce your cortisol levels. So it's about making sure there is a bit of a reward system in place there for you as well, so that you are being, you are, you are showing yourself gratitude and appreciating the efforts that you have taken yeah. Yeah. Um, to try and overcome this yeah. and just reminding yourself that regardless if you can usually do these things, no bother. Right now, you're struggling yeah. and, you know, you can overcome it, but you need to show yourself a little bit of compassion in order to do it. Yeah. You'd mentioned when you were kind of asking me a question, this is where I get to ask you a question because <laughs> it's, it's one of the things that's always intrigued me and because climbers use this phrase a lot um, and you had mentioned a little bit that you sometimes use like dissociation and stuff like that. And, and I suppose for the purposes of the podcast, we can explain a little bit about what that means. But before we do that, I really, what I'm interested to know, and I'm interested to know from, I guess, a, a, a clinical perspective, more so than a, <laughs> more so than a, a climbing uh, from, a, from the position of a climber. Um, but I've heard people use the phrase, climbing is my therapy. Yeah. And yeah. I'm always intrigued to, to find out what that means. Like, what does that mean to that individual? And... And I'm really interested to know, because you've been climbing for, what, 27 years um, or something like 28 that? 28 years 20, 28 yeah, years. Oh, yeah. I Don't beg your pardon. Change. Don't you short beg your me. pardon. So you've been climbing for, like, 28 years now. You'll have gathered a lot of wisdom. You'll have had a lot of <laughs> failings and, Plenty. you know. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, you know, when you say climbing is my therapy, what what does that mean to you? Ooh. So it's it's different for me. It, it, climbing is definitely my form of therapy, but I use it in different ways depending on what therapy I feel like I need at the time. Okay. So, you know, sometimes, you know, like we said at the start, we might be dealing with other stuff on in our lives outside of climbing, just general life mm -hmm. being general life as it is, mm -hmm. you know, and dealing with the stresses that comes along with that sometimes gets... A lot, you know, it, it can build up to a point where it's like, oh my God, I need to step away from all of this just for a second and go and do something else. Yeah. And just not, I just need to clear my head from all of this because it's too much to consider. It's too much to think about right now. Mm -hmm. And that's where, for me, going, you know, bouldering or, or sport climbing is 
great for that mm -hmm. because when I'm on a boulder or when I'm on a sport climb mm -hmm. and it's that almost 100% performance based, mm -hmm. I am only focused entirely on that next move, mm -hmm. that body position, that foot placement. Mm -hmm. I can't, I don't have the space in my head to think about anything else whatsoever. So I, I'm totally dissociating from from all of the other thoughts that were getting me down or stressing me out or whatever, and I'm just focusing on this one thing. And yes, when I finish climbing, I have to go back to normal life yeah. again, yeah. you know, but it, it gives me that moment to just calm down mm -hmm. so that I can come back to normal life with a bit more of a clear head, yeah. you know, and a little bit more of a calm head. Mm -hmm. um, but... You know, not all of the stresses and anxieties and whatever from life get to that super, super intense stage, but they're always there kind of bubbling on yeah. in the background. Yeah. And that's where I really love trad climbing and more specifically multi-pitch trad climbing because you you climb a, a pitch or you climb a route, uh, your partner comes up to you and then they disappear off mm -hmm. and climb the next pitch and you're left for 45 minutes on a ledge <laughs> in the middle of nowhere on your own and the only person you have to speak to yourself uh, the only person you have to speak to is yourself yeah so it's a great time for you you there's nothing else for you to do yeah. bar sit in your own head and mm -hmm. deal with your thoughts and yeah. I, I find it really therapeutic sometimes to just have that moment of sitting be laying safely i want to add <laughs> but you know just running through things in my head and, and kind of working stuff out you know i find yeah. it I find it really therapeutic and it's definitely helps doing that being in the outdoors for sure yeah. you know but it just gives me that time mm -hmm. you know away from other voices away from other distractions to just deal with it yeah. yeah so yeah climbing for me definitely is a therapy and i use it in different ways depending on what i feel like i need at the time mm -hmm. um but yeah that's that's what it is for me mm -hmm. interesting interesting it's funny because you use you use the word word dissociation a couple of times and and just for for people listening um when we're talking about dissociation so dissociation it, it sits on a spectrum so it can be on the severe end um where it can be more related to severe and enduring diagnosis um but it can exist in a in a very mild form so it's effectively where we we disconnect from the the present moment the present thoughts our present body even altogether because we, we can't deal with what's being presented to us at this moment in time, so we just have to escape it, mm. in a sense. Um, it can be really helpful in the immediate here and now because it's allowing us to just separate ourselves from whatever is causing us the stress, the trauma, or whatever might be going on. And it allows us to be able to just either get on with a task that we're doing or to be able to still enjoy mm. if we're, we're in the outdoors. It's not a good long-term strategy because effectively it's a form of avoidance <laughs> yes <laughs> and, and that's the reason why I asked that question is because I wonder when say climbing when people say climbing is my therapy I, I wonder if they're using it as a means to avoid what's going on in life or if they're using it a bit like how you say you actually use it like if you're multi-pitch you describe that you actually you use that as a safe space to be able to explore what's going on in your mind mm. Because you can do it in a, a space where you're on your own, you're in the outdoors, you're doing something that, that brings you a good level of joy um, and you actually can use it in a really helpful way. So you're not actually necessarily avoiding or, or dissociating from the thing itself. You're actually just trying to be in a position where you're able or you feel you can approach whatever yeah, these yeah. thoughts are at the time um, so that you can process it. So I find it really interesting and I, I think it would be interesting to hear what that means to to individuals because I, I imagine it means something different. Yeah, I think it will. Um well there's a there's a good shout out to the audience. Yeah. Like if you if you have found yourself doing any of these techniques or using climbing in, in a therapeutic way or you've found your own ways of dealing with the anxiety before or on a climb or whatever, yeah. um let us know. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, because I think you know you can never share too much when it comes to things like that. And actually, you could have a really good strategy that other climbers haven't thought of. Yeah, absolutely. And having these conversations is so important. Um, just be able to to open up about yeah. our struggles with with our anxieties or stress with climbing. Um, so I think it's a good platform to be able to 
to open that up. Yeah, grand. Um, well, what I'll do is I'll I'll stick my my email address at mm-hmm. the because I think uh, we've only got a comment section on the on the podcast. Oh. <laughs> we haven't got an email for the podcast. What yeah. I'll do is I'll stick my email address in the yeah. in the description for this. And yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, and and I'm happy for people if they want to to ask me questions or anything like that. And yeah, I'm happy to answer anyone's questions. They can send me a message or whatever. Cool. So I mean, like that's been amazing. That's been great to go through. I'm so glad we did the the point the the point five episode of this. <laughs> I'm so glad we managed to sit down uh, and do it. And yeah, I think the kind of the, the main points that we went through is bailing is always an option. Yeah. And there's things that you can do to to do that bailing. You know, yeah. we, we we can go home, we can hang out with friends, we can just be in the outdoors, we can climb something else, we can bailing is always an option. Yeah. Um if we want to deal with that, there are ways that we can try and manage that anxiety before we get on the climb. The breathing techniques, the taking a walk, the eating properly, the route reading. Um, and if you feel it coming on when you're on a route, trying that grounding technique. And remember that, you know, that these are all things that we kind of need to practice. Um, but it's also important to remember, I think, like, I definitely came across this. I've dealt with this a few times, that if these things don't work for you straight away... That's okay. You haven't failed. It's not yeah. a failure. It takes practice to to work at these things and get good at doing these things. It doesn't mean that you failed. It just means that today just isn't that day. Yeah. You know, today is not the day. Keep practicing your anxiety management and the day will yeah. come. Failure is just an opportunity to try again. <laughs> yes. Learn. It's an opportunity to learn and yes. to try again. Yeah, absolutely. And, do you know, listen... You can never have too much climbing. So if you have to try, if you have to quote unquote fail lots of times on a particular route or 50 different routes, you get to climb more. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's actually, it's again, it's just flipping things on their head and just being like, well, actually, do I lose out of this? No, because I get to just keep climbing. And remember, like Lana said at the end of the last episode, one of the best ways for managing your anxiety is making sure that you do your buddy checks. Way. <laughs> <laughs>